All right. Well, it is a pleasure and an honor to be back with you today on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, which is a, a great, great organization uh, who has just amazing resources for persons that are um, suffering with Parkinson, persons that are beating Parkinson. Um, they are the, the go-to place and, um, and have really done some, some amazing work. So it's really uh, very cool for me to be back with you today. We're going to spend the hour today doing a, a, uh, a Facebook Live. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of these for the coronavirus uh, and COVID-19, and, um, and it's been really enjoyable. And then we did one on living with Parkinson's disease. This is this book that just came out, and uh, it was so popular, and the questions just kept coming that we decided we'd keep doing it. So we do some more and see if there are questions and there are ways that we can um, we can help as much as, as, as we can. And we certainly want to create um, as many bridges um, as possible. You know, I want to mention to you that, that one of the the best um, parts of the Parkinson's Foundation is they started this amazing um, helpline, and these are real live people, trained nurses and healthcare professionals who are there to answer your questions live, and you can call and actually talk to someone. So certainly we've always had the forums, and I did ask the doctor for many years, but this is sort of a step up now. We still have the forums, but we have um, now the ability to, to talk with you directly. And so I want to make sure that I call out that group because they're, they're so special. And the, the, um, the line for them is 1-800, the number 4PD-INFO, 1-800-4PD-INFO. And you can reach out. They'll answer your questions. And guess what? They'll even answer your questions in Spanish. And, um, and I know some of my books have been translated into 20 languages. We're not quite there with the helpline, but it, one step at a time. We have Spanish-speaking um, healthcare professionals on there, which is awesome. So if you need help, please reach out. You can also ask them for the Aware and Care Kit. This is the kit that we um, offer for uh, people that are going into the hospital. It can really save lives. It can help to make sure you get your meds on time every time to make sure they do all the right things. It has cutouts for your nurses, for your doctors. This is a great program. And then of course we have lots of free books that you can download uh, on the website on all sorts of topics from memory to mood to surgical therapies to deep brain stimulation to uh, when to know to start medications to um, to all sorts of, of topics that are are going to be important not only for people with Parkinson but also for family members so please um, go ahead we've got um, the the chat and the the comments are open and so I'm starting to see uh, comments come in from all over the world. You know, I've got my first comment from Mardo Jimenez. Greetings from Guatemala. Awesome, awesome to have you on from Guatemala. And you know, we do have the the uh, the uh, fantastic uh, Parkinson uh, helpline that now will answer your questions in Spanish. And so, Mardo, if you want to ask in Spanish, uh, one of our our great healthcare professionals on that line. It's one eight hundred four. PD info. So I, I told you that we're back by popular demand. This book, Living with Parkinson's Disease, was written uh, by myself uh, along with two really awesome Parkinson neurologists and a lot of our, our friends and colleagues have helped with this. Um, so Irene Malati, who is the director of the Center of Excellence, uh, the Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence at the University of Florida, with some Deeb, who's now uh, up at the University of Massachusetts. He uh, trained with us and was on faculty and is now helping to lead that program into a, a new generation. So we're super proud of Wissom. And we um, actually partnered with a group called Robert Rose. They're a publishing house. They're located up in Canada. And I normally wouldn't mention that, but the thing that is really cool about Robert Rose is they're famous for cookbooks. So if you go in your kitchen or you store all your cookbooks on a shelf close to your kitchen, you'll notice they published a lot of the greatest cookbooks. And the reason that we chose them as a publisher is because they're so good at organizing information and putting recipes together and, and really cutting through so that we could offer all the pearls and all the tips. And so we've had books that are about ending Parkinson's disease that we recently wrote, and we have books about secrets to a happier life. And this book is one that we really just wanted to 
to just push as many facts and as many pearls about um, ways that you can live um, better with Parkinson disease. And so one of the quotes in the book, there's a section at the end where we just have pearl after pearl uh, for, uh, for persons and for families is, is um, the reality of disease-oriented and self-help books is that while they're well-meaning, frequently they meet their end on a dusty bookshelf. And isn't that the truth? I mean, it's just one of those things where we continuously buy these books about self-help and they end up kind of dusty. This is a book that we want to make sure gets pulled off of that shelf as many times as, as possible. And the other thing that's nice is we have pictures throughout here. These have been shot by uh, Robert Dean and uh, he his wife um, had Parkinson disease and and he gives the book life by uh, showing pictures of real people who are living real lives and really great lives and he just really captures things in a nice way and so I, I think that's really great so before we take refer the first question I just want to read one quote that um, that the book starts out with it talks about a Chinese doctor and philosopher Lu Jun who famously said, hope is like a road in the country. There was never a road, but when many people walk on it, the road comes into existence. And we comment that it's critical for us to embrace the current and coming generation of Parkinson's disease and to create the path forward. It is important for Parkinson's patients to understand that there is a road, there is a path, and that path includes happiness and fulfillment. So with that, let's um, let's open up here. We got a whole hour and let's have some fun. Um, we've got a, uh, a comment here from uh, Salah Ahmed who um, talks about uh, you can join the top tips from living with Parkinson uh, on the live stream and he's got that uh, clicked up here uh, on the side. We've got the 1-800 number, 1-800-4PD-INFO. Um, uh, Mardo is telling me about uh, um, somebody that I know really well who gets their care here in Florida. Donna is doing really well in Guatemala City. And so, Mardo, thank you. It's good to get an update. Uh, and, uh, and, and in this forum, we get to share that with some friends. But it's great. It's great to hear that people are, are uh, living a good life uh, with Parkinson's disease. It's um, super super important. We've got Nikita Krelart, uh, greetings from the Netherlands. Awesome, awesome to uh, to have you on the Netherlands. I always like uh, questions from the Netherlands, Nikita, so hopefully you'll ask a question. You know, I like to, to give the the letter U because the letter U in Dutch is ooh, ooh. It's very hard to, to, to say it. We can't, we don't have the same translation in English and um, and so so it's great to have you on we see Nancy Doherty has a dear friend with Parkinson and Brittany Johnson is is on so welcome uh, to to uh, to Brittany and um, and uh, Amit uh, Ahmed says my dad has Parkinson's and I need some good tips uh, for for my dad and so I think it's um, uh, super important uh, Amit that um, that we think about you know, like what are our tips that are really good? And, you know, after doing this on meat for a lot of years, I'm going to tell you one thing that, that I've learned that I think is a, an important take home tip that maybe you can share with your dad. And that's that all um, not all physical, occupational and speech and swallow therapy are equal. And I made this mistake uh, throughout my career for many years, and we're often humbled. You know, I, I often say that I know less every day. I'm very humbled uh, to take care of uh, uh, people with Parkinson and uh, people with movement disorders and families, and, and it's a humbling experience. But what we end up doing as clinicians is we end up actually writing lots of prescriptions for physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech and swallow therapy and we just assume oh we just write the prescription you know boom it's done it should get taken care of and what we realize is that if you're not trained specifically as a therapist to deal with uh, the, um, the the problems of an individual and to have precision medicine approaches and people don't talk about precision medicine enough on meat and so you can tell your dad you need precision medicine when it comes to physical occupational and speech and swallow because if you get the wrong therapy you may actually um, you know precipitate 
you know, a worsening and falling and doing worse. And so making sure you have the right type of therapy for Parkinson is just as important as making sure that you have the right types of medicine. And take it from me because I've made that mistake over the years. So Amit, I want you to share that tip with your with your dad because I think that that's a good one. And I want you to seek out therapists that are trained in Parkinson. And if you can't find them, it's sometimes useful to seek out a center that has some expertise and have them write the plan and then go take care of the plan with the therapist closer at home, but have them follow that plan. So a lot of therapists can follow the plan if you tell them what to do. But if you don't tell them what to do, they might give you a therapy plan that's maybe for traumatic brain injury or back pain or something else. So so thanks, Amit. That was a great question. And uh, we, uh, I see uh, Glenda Meyer is on from South Dakota. Uh, Glenda, great to, great to hear from you. One of the best trips I ever uh, took with my wife was about 20 years ago. We talked to the Parkinson Foundation support group in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and no greater people on earth and, and a really you know great place uh, to, to take care of uh, each other in that community. And so it's, uh, it's great to see you. Amit is asking, where do you download the book from? It's on Amazon. It's on Audible. It, it has a nice British uh, voice. Uh, I'm not sure if, if our audio version of the book is up yet, but certainly the download version that is um, available now is uh, it can be either downloaded to, to your Kindle or to one of your devices that you can read, and then you can get a paperback copy on Amazon or in, the, in your local bookstore. So Gonzalo uh, Luenga, greetings from Chile. Great to have you on, Gonzalo. Again, we've got our, our helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO. They're all ready to answer your questions, Gonzalo. So if you speak Spanish and you don't uh, uh, quite understand some of the nuances of what's going on in English, we need to do better with that. And so that is uh, certainly uh, something that's important. And thanks to the Parkinson's Foundation for replying to Ahmed. Here, There's the link for the book and the versions that... Um, it's uh, uh, available to. Um, one of the questions comes in from Central America from Mardo. It's about uh, the medicine, of, you know, you can't get the medicine from the USA and we're paying a higher price in Guatemala City. And what do we do about that? This is a huge problem. The disparities in, in what we can provide in terms of of all the different medicines for Parkinson and all the different therapies, country to country and healthcare system to healthcare system, tend to favor the people who are at socioeconomic classes that are higher, meaning they make more money and so the wealthy get more, and the people that need the care, you know, we're not, you're not providing enough to the diversity. And so we've had a lot of conversations about this. And one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is this idea that if you take Africa as a just general construct and we say you've got all these people in Africa, you've got like, you know, less than 100 neurologists and a handful that know anything about Parkinson, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and yet you've got all these people that need medicine. And so it might be a little bit similar to what you're seeing, Mardo, in Central America, maybe a little better for you than it is there. And we've been thinking through this in the foundation and in expert groups, trying to think, what could we do better to make sure people get access? And one of the suggestions is pretty interesting. And that's that if you want to get dopamine or levodopa, it's actually um, grown in a plant that's a legume, L-E-G-U-M-E, legume. So many of you have legumes in your garden. And we now know there are several papers in the literature that you can take a form of dopamine called mucuna. Some people call it natural dopamine, but it really metabolizes it into dopamine. It doesn't have the carbidopa, so you could get nauseated or you might not get as much across to the brain. But it is a formulation that's been shown to be quite effective. You know, the problem is, is if you buy this mucuna from different sources over the Internet, you never know, Mardo, like what you're getting and what the strength is of it. And so the bioavailability is off. But one suggestion that, that people have made that I think is really quite fascinating to think about is could we all grow legumes in areas where people can't afford the Parkinson medications and learn to ground the legumes up and actually without any pharmaceutical processing plant, 
um, you know, replace dopamine for, for a generation, for, for millions of people that might not have as much access. And so this is something we need to think about how we're going to do this. It gets even worse when we talk about surgical therapies like deep brain stimulation. And there's a huge diversity gap, even in countries like the USA that where, where the therapy is available of who's actually getting the therapy. And then you have areas where people just can't get access to this. And so this is an issue. I think it's a huge issue. You're paying a higher price in Guatemala City and looking around. And when you look, Marto, for drugs, what I want you to do is look at, at one thing called bioavailability. So a generic drug only has to be within 20% bioavailable in the United States for it to be approved. So that means there can be a 20% difference in how much it gets into the bloodstream, okay, if you take it. And so when you're looking for replacements, just try to get a sense, if you can, of, of, of what the bioavailability is and how consistent it is. And if you can get a consistent manufacturer, even if they have a low bioavailability or high bioavailability, if you use the same pill or pills each time from the same manufacturer, it might work and you might be able to reduce your cost. So that's a couple of tips. It's a, it's a, it's a tough one. So um, great to see you. Corrine Bendix. Nice to have you on from Waterton, South Dakota, and um, hope you're doing uh, doing well there. We love Custer National Park, and we love the, the Corn Palace, and so I'm looking forward to my next trip to South Dakota. For those of you that haven't been, it's it's one of the, the best places on Earth, the most beautiful to, to visit. So, Nikita, thank you for commenting on all the different faces of Parkinson. We do have all of these pictures, and we want to really bring home, you know, to everyone that this is a um, this is really a disease of people, and that there are people that are living good lives with Parkinson disease. And so, having a picture of each person was really special for Dr. Malati, Dr. Deeb, and myself. And we really thank Bob Dean for the vision of uh, of delivering that. And so I think that's been been just um, just terrific. So and um, so thanks for for all. I'm seeing a bunch of a bunch of comments on that. Uh, Brittany is joining us from Ville uh, Plata, Louisiana. Uh, 35 years. I don't know if that means you've had Parkinson for 35 or a spouse for 35, but that's pretty awesome. And we're also Sending out positive thoughts for you, Brittany, as we know a bunch of storms have headed there that way, and uh, and we want to make sure that you that you that you stay um, safe. So Kathy Witta Fisk uh, has a question about festination, and um, and so let me just pause before I read her question and explain to those of you who are saying, "What the heck is he talking about? What is festination?" Well. We know it's pretty common in Parkinson to take these short steps, right? And so you take these little, you know, kind of short steps and, and we, we, we sometimes refer to that as shuffling and some people have trouble um, with freezing up or maybe one foot sticks to the ground or occasionally two feet stick to the ground. And if you try to turn, you might fall. But then there's this problem called festination and sometimes the doctors talk over the family members and they don't explain that. Festination is a word that means you chase your center of gravity. So those of you that are listening, you might have seen um, someone you know with Parkinson do this. It's where maybe they're leaning forward a little bit, they're, they start shuffling, and then their feet get going, and then they start chasing their center of gravity. It looks like almost like they're running forward, and they almost need to grab onto something, a couch, or they end up falling. And so they're chasing their center of gravity. That is called festination it's a it's a it's not an uncommon symptom that we see in parkinson disease and so kathy you see that in your husband and he's refusing to use his uh his walker any pointers to get him to use the walker okay so i think this is um really really super important the number one thing that we can do is prevent falls so i tell folks when they come in to see me um, in the clinic i always say you know what's our goal with falling our goal is to get to zero falls and there are reasons uh, kathy to explain that you need to get to zero falls and probably the most important is that you can get fractures so you can break an arm or break a leg or break a hip and that these fractures when you get them they lead to an increased mortality death rate and increased morbidity and, and a decrease of independence. 
those are three really good reasons for people to try to use walkers. Now, I would say, Kathy, it's important to make sure that he's not underdosed on his medication. Occasionally, we see people with festination and we increase the dose of dopamine or, or we decrease the intervals because we notice the festination is happening when they're wearing off between dosages. So maybe they're trying to make the medicine go too far and they need to move it together to three hour intervals or two hour intervals. They may be under medicated and then rarely sometimes high medication in some people can actually cause festination. And if you back off a little bit, sometimes less is more, they get better. So optimization of the medicine is number is number one, first thing that you should do. Second thing is explaining the morbidity, the mortality, and the, and the importance to getting that fall rate to zero. Third is getting a physical therapist involved to, to help to fit for the right assistive device and also to give advice and work with the person. And sometimes if it's continuous destination and they really need to be worked with a lot so they understand how to use the walker, sometimes even a short admission to a rehab a type of facility where a neurologist and a rehab doctor and some physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists can work with you, work on festination. Oftentimes festination comes with speech problems. They're also tripping over their words as well. Sometimes that can be really helpful to getting people together on the same page. And then finally, an, a regular exercise program, okay? A regular exercise program is so important. And if you can afford it, then having a, a, a regular personal trainer can be great. And of course, not everybody can, can afford that, but, um, but it is useful. And sometimes just the reminders, remember Parkinson is a disease of cueing. So if you remind your husband a lot and the, and the therapists are reminding and they're doing exercise um, classes and exercise therapy and getting reminded a lot, that can decrease their fall rate. So thank you, Festination, super important and particularly important for decreasing the risk of falling. So it, um, it looks like um, Nikita Krilart uh, is, um, says thank you to Parkinson's Foundation. So I'll, I'll say um, you're welcome uh, on behalf of the foundation. We're, we're really happy to, um, to, to have, you, uh, have you ask a question here today. And, um, and Nikita, I believe is from the Netherlands, wants to know uh, about Parkinson being more known as an old people's disease but how can you explain to other people that it's so much more than only tremor? So Nikita, thank you for your question. Um, again, a really important concept. So if you go and you see me in my clinic, I have people in their teens and young people all the way up to centenarians. So, so Parkinson can occur at any age. And so most people don't understand that. And one of the reasons that we believe that Parkinson is so underdiagnosed is that sometimes when younger people have it, they say, oh, you know, with or without a tremor, you're too young. You can't have Parkinson. It's an old person's disease, but we need to do a better job. We are just not hitting it out of the infield, as you would say in, uh, in baseball, or hitting it in the goal, as you might say in soccer or football. We are not doing a good enough job on our education to let people know that it can occur at any disease, um, at any age in this disease. The other thing is, is that it becomes more common with age. So as we age, your chances of getting Parkinson go up. So if you live to be 100, they're up very high and they're much lower if you're in your teens or your 20s. The people that come down with Parkinson before the age of 50 are more likely to have a genetic abnormality, but not all people have genetic abnormalities. And in fact, only 15 to 20% of Parkinson um, people have a single DNA mutation or abnormality that underpins or causes the Parkinson. And only one in five people don't have that tremor. And so four out of five have a tremor, but you're gonna miss 20%. One in five is a huge number of people without tremor. So we've got to do a better job delivering the data. And then when we look at Ray Dorsey, and we recently wrote this book called Ending Parkinson's Disease, where we talk about 
age not being the only thing that's driving the growth of Parkinson's. We talk about the fact that when you control for age, the explosive growth of this disease, it is the fastest growing disease now in neurology, in neurological disease. And we say that again, it's the fastest growing disease in neurologic disease, fastest growing, faster than Alzheimer's disease, stroke, brain tumors, other things. So age doesn't actually account for all of that growth. And so we also also think that there are probably environmental and other factors and exposures. And so as it explodes, it's going to bankrupt um, some of our healthcare systems, many of our healthcare systems and stress them. And we're gonna need to have people understand that it's a disease that gets more common with age, but not only driven by age and can occur at any age. So not just an old person's disease. And in fact, we study at the Parkinson's Foundation through a project called the Parkinson's Outcome Project. People have had Parkinson for a long time, and there's many subtypes, some with tremor, some without, some young, some old. We got to tell our story. And so this is why social media is important. This is why Facebook Live is important. This is why we write books that get stuck in uh, in warehouses. And that's where this book was stuck during COVID and finally got out of the warehouse. We got to get our education out to help as many people as we can so thank you for that question nikita you know great great to have you on from from your from the netherlands ani tree um ani you're from indonesia fantastic to have uh, someone from indonesia one of our former fellows we've trained over 70 uh docs that work in parkinson all over the world and so shout out to frandy susadia who we trained who's in indonesia and so ani asks um i see in my country a lot of people like parkinson's and tremor so I want to learn and maybe I can help them. And so Ani, you know, thank you for, for saying that. And it turns out that as we've traveled the world and we've lectured for the Parkinson Foundation all over Asia and Europe and Australia and the US and North America, South America, haven't been to Antarctica yet, the, um, the growth in this disease, Ani, is tremendous. And by population, Indonesia is just as affected percentage-wise as any other place on the planet. And the growth has been described as a pandemic. And we actually wrote about that in our book, 10 Secrets to a Happier Life. And then recently in this book, Ending Parkinson's, we talk about how this growth that we see in countries like Indonesia and countries like China, and China has the largest burden, is, uh, is really explosive where there are high population centers and we now see that it has the growth potential of, of what we would call a pandemic. And so we've been accused of calling it a Parkinson's pandemic, guilty. We, uh, we coined that term uh, back in 2013 in our 10 Secrets to a Happier Life. We fully acknowledge pandemic is a word that's been taken over by the World Health Organization to refer to infectious diseases, but the actual definition of that word goes beyond infectious diseases, Ani. Um, in it's actually Greek and has Latin derivatives. Pan means all. Demos means people. So pandemic, it has all of the trappings of a pandemic, except for it's not infectious. It originally wasn't a word that was infectious. And so we've got to teach people. And just like Nikita said from the Netherlands, one in five people don't have a tremor. And so it's super important that we don't miss the diagnosis. And younger people can look different than maybe people who are a little more seasoned or a little bit older. So thank you for that question. Keep looking out from Indonesia. Let's try to get some information to you. There's lots of free information at the Parkinson's Foundation and then direct people to our 1-800-4PD-INFO um, helpline and we're happy to help. Stephen Moore shouts out with a nice emoji, uh, hello and, uh, and uh, a little bit of a halo here. So we uh, appreciate that. Gonzalo's talking about uh, his mother uh, with uh, Parkinson disease. And so we moved to Canada now. And so uh, Jean uh, Regame Jean uh, uh, from Edmonton, sorry if I uh, butchered your name a little bit, Jean, but uh, great to have you on. Uh, wants to know about his mom has Parkinson's. She's been diagnosed for about 20 years, so that's two decades. And now at 82, so this is going from age 62 to 82, struggling much more these days with uncontrollable tremors and movements. What can I do? What are some of the some of the tips? 
So, Jean, one of the things that um, that we try to teach and some of the pearls that we have in the book is is that if the medications and if the therapies aren't changing over time, if you've been doing the same thing for many years with Parkinson, you may not uh, be optimizing um, the overall picture uh, for your mom. And it's super important because sometimes we just say, okay, well, they have a mild form of Parkinson. Your mom's had it for 20 years. And, um, and then as it begins to progress, some things like uncontrollable tremors get in and we don't do enough to try to control those. So there's multiple medications that we can use to control tremors. We even have uh, an operation called deep brain stimulation that can be used. It's a little bit uh, a higher risk in 82 year olds, but sometimes we do it in elderly um, folks, depending on their risk benefit ratio. Sometimes we can adjust the medications or try different medications uh, for the tremor or different devices and therapies. And so there's a whole bunch of different things that can be done. Now, in general, John, I also want to mention that 20 to 40 percent of folks with Parkinson may have either a completely resistant tremor, meaning their tremor doesn't respond to any medication, and uh, or they have a tremor that only responds partially to medications. So if you see that, Jean, those are uh, folks that we start thinking about other therapies like deep brain stimulation, like the Duopa, the pump version of, uh, of Levodopa to see if we can suppress that tremor with a little more continuous um, of stem. We've been more uh, successful with DBS and then there are some other interesting new, uh, you know, therapies that are coming along and even some things in the uh, exercise and rehabilitation, uh, um, you know, areas. And so sorry that your mom's struggling. If we didn't get to some of those things, feel free to call our 1-800 helpline. If they can't answer you, they usually will ask me. We meet with them regularly and they're just awesome. So, you know, shout out to Alberta and uh, and hoping that your, your, uh, your mom uh, does better and finds uh, something to help with the with the tremors. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that there is, for one side of the brain, there is a newer um, uh, therapy called focused ultrasound, where they can shoot a sound wave from the outside onto one side of the brain for tremors only at this point that has FDA approval in the US. And so sometimes that can be a, a safer option for people who are elderly. It can only be done on one side of the brain because at this time we're worried if we do it on two sides, like we used to make a lot of lesions historically many years ago, um, and we still occasionally make lesions. We know that it affects the voice and it affects your talking and can affect your thinking if we do it on two sides of the brain. So focused ultrasound may be something else to look into, Jean, in that, in that uh, age range uh, when sometimes deep brain stimulation is a little too risky. So Bharti Udeshi, thank you, uh, Bharti, um, talks about walking aids, helping with controlling um, gait. And I just want to mention a, a few of those that um, can be really useful. We once took care of a famous race car driver, and he would freeze up, you know, so he'd be walking along. So we talked about that one foot would freeze or another foot would freeze, particularly in the crowds of the airport. And he would shine an early version of, a, of like a PowerPoint pointer, a laser pointer down at the ground, and he'd step on the pointer and he was able to restore his walking. So that's called a cue. And, and now fast forward, we should have patented that at the time. Companies have now uh, figured this out and they put uh, laser lights onto canes and they put laser lights onto um, uh, walkers to try to give cues, visual cues. Now, not every person freezes with Parkinson and not every person will respond to a cue, Barty, but that is something that is important when you're thinking about the walking aids in terms of, of cueing. Another thing we've learned is, is um, using things like metronomes. So you can buy a metronome that keeps time, tock, tick, 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 and that can be helpful. Certain types of music, certain Beats. Christopher Haas here did a study with his graduate students with uh, Liz Stegmuller and, and others here. They did a nice study looking at the Bee Gees was one of the, the, uh, the bands that really helped to enhance walking and Parkinson. And so some of the audio cues and sensory cues. And so there's a whole bunch of things that can uh, potentially be done, Barty. And one of the reasons to see a doc who's really good uh, at this and a physical therapist who has uh, some expertise in this area to see if cueing or another strategy or a certain type of assistive device can be um, can be helpful. And then, of course, we talked about making sure that, that folks know it's important to 
bring that fall rate down to zero because we don't want to end up in a nursing home or with morbidity or mortality from a break of a bone or something like that. So, so thanks, Barty. That was a great, um, a great question. So Corrine Bendix has a question asking, will deep brain stimulation solve freezing of gait or uh, the destination problem, getting to the destination, I think? My husband has Parkinson and his meds are not holding past two hours. Corrine, thank you for the question. Um, this is um, a big fat maybe, okay? And let me, let me uh, clarify that. Some people that you talk to about deep brain stimulation, we've done over 2,000 cases, will just say, don't do it for walking, um, don't do it for balance, uh, don't do it for thinking, and don't do it for talking. So walking, talking, thinking, balance, those are the general things that we say, ah, the DBS technology may not be quite there. But what we know now from looking at the data that's come in, from lots of data, from lots of studies, even in our own experiences, is that some people improve with freezing after the deep brain stimulation. You say, well, how is that possible? We just said, you know, we don't think the walking improves. Well, walking and freezing, two different things. So you have to separate those two things out. And the folks that are having off freezing, so meaning that when the medicine is kicked in, they don't freeze, okay? So let's say that you're taking it every two hours, but when it kicks in at an hour, your husband's not freezing. He has, he may be one of those 30% that has some improvement in freezing after the deep brain stimulator. And so you wanna know, is it off freezing? Is it freezing when the medication has worn off? That's a key aspect to try to predict the possibility. It's still not 100%, but it's a higher possibility. He may be in that one in three group that has improvement in freezing after deep brain stimulation. DBS will not improve balance, will oftentimes make balance worse, and so it's important to remember that. So sometimes you don't freeze. If your balance gets worse um, or doesn't change, you could still fall. So you could still get rid of the freezing and still fall. And remember, Kareem, when you freeze, you're most likely to freeze when you turn. And so making sure to work with the therapists and the personal trainers and your exercise therapy to take big, wide turns. Don't try to turn on a dime quickly because that could lead to a, uh, a freezing event. So super, super good question, Corrine. Uh, it's, a, it's a big maybe. And so these are the qualified questions that we have to have, you know, really more substantive discussion with our families. And so I often say when you screen for deep brain stimulation, one of the tips we talk about in the book, one of the pearls in living with Parkinson is that you need to have a multidisciplinary um, effort. And so you have neurologists, neurosurgeon, neuropsychologist, PTOT, speech swallow therapist, sometimes a nutritional therapist talking. And, and then we need to talk behind your back, Corrine. You say, oh my God, he's going to talk behind my back. This isn't good. And actually in healthcare, the highest level of care you can hope for, here's a tip for you, a pearl, is when people actually talk behind your back form a risk benefit ratio after talking about all the possibilities and actually are willing to sit down, call you, talk to you, call you back, have a meeting about you know what they found. And so this is super important and we need to do uh, a better job okay, of this. Krista Greenwalt talks about my dad stubborn. He won't use a walker. He's starting to shuffle his feet. So Krista, you know, this is like super important that you get on this early because sometimes it takes a little time and you, you want to trying to minimize the falling in that in-between area. See if you can uh, find a Parkinson-specific therapist or somebody who has some expertise or has worked with a lot of Parkinson. Start working with him regularly. If you're really concerned he's going to fall, you may want to even consider an inpatient stint to try to get them to work with him every day and convince him that it, it is it is really to his benefit to use the walker. And then one of the tips that we often talk about is is super important to communicate and to your dad and to have your your team communicate and that's that a lot of people are embarrassed and some people from different generations are just embarrassed to have a walker they don't want people to see them with a walker and um, it turns out that when you ask people on the other side the people on the other side are not you know they don't look at at you differently because you don't have a walker they actually look at you more positively because you have a walker and that's helping you to walk. They hate to see you suffer. And so it's actually the opposite 
of what you by human nature are thinking. You're thinking, oh my gosh, people are looking at me. I have a walker and you know, I don't want people to see me with the walker, but actually people are aging just like you. They've got other things to think about, believe it or not. They're not thinking about you or your dad throughout you know, 24 hours a day. I know it might be a shock, but they're not. And we know from asking them that they're actually more concerned. People are more concerned that you're getting the help that you need and would love to see you with the walker than without it. And so, you know, it takes time and sometimes multiple visits. You can't win it all in a day on these conversations, Krista, but these are some of the things that we that we generally um, think about. So thanks for that question. We've got a question from Dallas, Texas. So welcome from the Midwest here. Esmeralda Castro asked, uh, my mom's diagnosed with Parkinson's because of her tremor. She's tried several medication combinations, no improvement, no slowing of tremor progression. I am trying to learn as much as I can, and in doing so, I came across a treatment called uh, HIFU, a, a, a procedure like Neurovive. What are your thoughts on uh, on these procedures? So thank you. So um, first of all, uh, when you are taking a bunch of medications and you're not seeing an improvement, that should be a timeout. We say timeout. Okay, what's going on here? Before we start talking about surgeries, you know, like focused ultrasound or sound waves from the outside, you know, to help swallowing. Let's call a timeout and say, okay, are we sure that we're not responding to medications? And so we like to see the dosages at, you know, at least three tablets of the 25-100 or an equivalent of 300 milligrams per dose and then over 1,000 milligrams per day total, but at least 300 per dose. If you're not seeing any dyskinesia, any extra movements from that high dose medication, you should scratch your head and say, hmm, what's going on here? And if you're not seeing any benefit, and the way to document benefit is to have your doc take a scale that's publicly available on the Movement Disorders website called the Unified Parkinson Disease Rating Scale, the UPDRS. It's like scoring for golf, lower is better. Have them score you up, take your medicines, take those three tablets, wait an hour, hour and a half till you turn on, or maybe you don't turn on, just wait an hour and a half, score again, because sometimes you're actually improving and you're not seeing it because the tremor is not improving or some aspect isn't improving, but everything else is. And so it's important to understand that subtlety. So we call that an on-off challenge. And if you're not seeing the improvement, then we usually recommend, if there's no dyskinesia, no extra dance-like movements, that you then pursue something called a gastric emptying study. So here's another uh, tip. We have this tip in our book under the, the gastrointestinal and the, all those issues that can come up. But one of the reasons sometimes people don't um, have a response to the medications is, is that the meds aren't getting out of their stomach. And so you put a little dye in the stomach, it's a nuclear medicine test, real simple, we'll see how long it takes to leave. If it takes a long time, then we need to work on gastric emptying and that's the issue. And so you got to go through those motions. And then if you're not responding, sometimes we give a shock called apomorphine, you know, into the arm. It's a dopamine agonist, doesn't need the bloodstream. And then if you wake up and the person's moving, then there's something going on with the absorption. So if you've done all that and you're still not there, seeing an expert or a specialist in Parkinson to see if you have another Parkinson lookalike syndrome is the most common issue. And you've got to decide, do I have Parkinson or do I have something like multiple system atrophy or PSP? Because to do something like focused ultrasound in general, not always, but in general, you probably don't want to do it unless you have regular Parkinson. And so this would be the things that I would think about before going to more invasive things. I think these more invasive things are great. I've done them my whole career, these types of things like deep brain stimulation, but you gotta actually get to the core of the problem and the core of the diagnosis. And so I, I think that's cer certainly super important. And, and John uh, from, uh, from Canada asks another question here. How do you know if the meds are optimized? Awesome question. We talk about this in the Living with Parkinson book. It takes time and you can't um, have magical thinking and so many docs and healthcare teams in medicine now have magical thinking. What do I mean by that? I, I mean that they are thinking that, oh, well, I'm going to see you one time and I'm really smart and I live in this ivory tower or castle and I'm going to fix you. Now, that's not how it works in Parkinson. Parkinson is a moving target. It takes time and it takes multiple visits with an expert changing not only the type of medicine, the orange one, the purple one, and the combinations, but 
the the intervals the timing timing is so important and over time you've got to spend a good amount of time to make sure that you're optimized and sometimes you got to push the system a little bit to make sure that you're fully optimized and that you're responding sometimes you're under medicated and falling and then you give a little more medicine and you stop falling subject you, you push a little more and you get a little extra movement with dyskinesia so you Jean needs to have a great relationship with your team so you're you're pushing and tweaking the system and and together you're working and you know who knows uh, the optimization better than anyone is the person themselves and we forget that it's the person who's actually living with the Parkinson that knows but we've got to do a better job and one of the tips we talk about in the book about depression it's so important is we've got to stop diagnosing depression and just giving the pill and and having magical thinking that it's gonna work We've been doing this for years in Parkinson, and we know Parkinson, the largest unmet hurdle is the treatment of depression. But what we need to be doing is making that diagnosis. We're not making it enough, so that's good we're making it more. But when we make it, we need to optimize the therapy. That means you take your pill, we monitor you, make sure you're not having suicidal thoughts, make sure you're not having side effects, see you back in a few weeks, change the dose if we need to, make sure that we've optimized you. So how do we know if you're being optimized? Multiple visits to the doc. And that sometimes strains a healthcare system. But John, that's a great question, something we talk about a lot in this book, and we talk about a lot at the foundation and a lot on our 1-800-4PD-INFO um, book. So it's super, super important. John Colette asks, why is there a large amount of people with Parkinson's in Indiana? John, guess what? There's a large amount of Parkinson in the world now, and those numbers are, are more than doubling from, you know, 1990, the next 25-year epic of forward, you know, to 2015, and then the next epic, 25-year epic to 2040, it's going to more than double again. It's just growing everywhere. We're recognizing it more. It's growing more than just based on age. People are getting older, so they get more degenerative diseases like Parkinson, but it doesn't account for that growth. And so Ray Dorsey and Todd Scherer and Boss Bloom and I wrote this book to talk about how alarming this is. So it's not just Indiana. This is a, a worldwide problem. So we need to to um, to join our hands. And there's a great group, John, called the PD Avengers, one of my favorite groups. And so we wrote this book about ending Parkinson's disease. They read the book and they decided we're going to get a million, maybe even 50 million, but starting with a million people to sign on the Ending Parkinson's Disease website, the Parkinson's Pact, Prevent, Advocate, Care, and Treat. It's something we should all be able to agree on in all states, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you're in the U.S., and whether or not you're in any other country. We should all come to some common ground as to what we need to do, like what happened with polio, like what happened with HIV, and so we need to get more active. But there's a ton of people, young and old, in Indiana, but all around uh, with that. So. Um, so super uh, important. So um, Krista talks about my mom tells my dad to, to to tell him to stop shuffling his feet. So sometimes these these little cues can be super important and useful, but sometimes nagging people too much can also take away the quality of life. And one of the things that that um, that one of the chapters in the book uh, addresses is this idea of demoralization. One in six, one in five people with Parkinson, they're not depressed, they're not anxious in a lot of cases, they're just demoralized. And then sometimes we throw, you know, a, a little bit on top of the fire and make that fire, you know, that flame get even bigger by nagging them over and over, you know, about certain things. And so it is important to cue them, but it's important to figure out strategies that also are not uh, degrading the value of your relationship with your loved ones by nagging too much. And so this is um, really super uh, important and, and something that, uh, that, that I, I've really uh, found to be, uh, to be useful. Uh, Nikita talks about uh, Parkinson for almost three years. She's 23. So Nikita is in her 20s, started very quick with levodopa. It had an immediately positive effect. And Nikita, when we see Parkinson in 20-year-olds, I saw another one yesterday, um, they oftentimes uh, have a genetic uh, abnormality, a little change in their DNA. And the most common one in your age group that responds to dopamine is called Parkin or Park 2 which you can get your genetics tested. And this may become important, Nikita, uh, for treatment. So certain treatments work really well in Parkinson uh, patients who have the Parkin mutation, for example. Levodopa works really well 
Uh, you can end up with more motor fluctuations, less cognitive or thinking dysfunction. So you can live a good long life, but DBS works very well. We know uh, from the data now. And so having your genetic status can be useful. And then as we're beginning to uh, move to the next generation and Parkinson's Foundation has a, a project called PD Generation and a cute name, right? PD Generation. And, and people are now wanting to know what their genetic status is. Now, I, I caution you, a lot of times you want to have a genetics counselor so you know the implications of whether or not you have a gene or not. And sometimes you have a gene for Parkinson, but you never express it in life. And so if Gregor Mendel was here, it's not as simple as crossing peas. He might be turning in his grave because it's a little, little trickier. But in the future here, particularly for the LARC2 mutation, and for the GBA mutation, we're already starting to see um, a, uh, a, a, a movement toward personalized medicine and personalized clinical trials. And so PD generation is helping people with the Parkinson Foundation to get their genotype so they can be ready for clinical trials when they, uh, when they come along. So that's a, a, good, a good pearl. So Barty uh, Udeshi asks, what book do I keep talking about? Sorry, Barty. Here's the book. It was caught, um, unfortunately, it's called Living with Parkinson's Disease, published by Robert Rose. Um, it's up on Amazon and other book sources. It was caught in the, um, in the early COVID crisis. It was caught in the warehouses. Couldn't get them out and couldn't get them delivered. But as of the past few weeks, they're getting out and, and being bought up throughout the world. So hopefully you all will read it. Leave us a review on Amazon. Feel free to tweet me. My Twitter is at Michael Oaken, would love to, to hear from you. And uh, and then, of course, use our 1-800-PARKINSON, 1-800-4PD-INFO uh, helpline. And so, Barty, uh, thanks for the uh, for the question. So, Alpana Gore, uh, Alpana asks, what's the role of mag, magnesium in Parkinson's and in dystonia? So, magnesium is a super interesting uh, element uh, that we know about in the body. And, in fact, when we get our um, our laboratories and we look at magnesium, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 changes in magnesium can be huge shifts in the amount of magnesium in your body. So if you're a little bit short or you have a little bit too much, you can, it, it, is, uh, it, it can be uh, indicative of either magnesium deficiency or having too much magnesium. Neurologically, when you have too much magnesium, um, things change, like you can lose your reflexes. If you don't have enough magnesium, your reflexes can get can get uh, can increase and so it can change neurological reflexes when your neurologist hits you with the hammer and things like that we have not come down on a role yet individually uh, for magnesium as a treatment for for parkinson we do recommend that parkinson uh, folks take a good multivitamin that includes magnesium and uh, and uh, other core elements but we we want you to be careful not to take uh, certain things like too much vitamin B6. You, know, you get crazy and take too many vitamins. We see people come in with neuropathies. And so too much of these vitamins is a treatment as well. But individually, there's been some speculation about role of magnesium and other elements in Parkinson's and in dystonia. We just don't quite have the answer yet. I'll keep looking, and uh, I promise you, Alpana, if I see something, we'll put it up on our blog. We have a blog at parkinsonsecrets.com. Um, Indu Subramanian at UCLA and I have been writing and interviewing experts. And so if we come across something, we'll share it with you on our parkinsonsecrets.com or on the Parkinson Foundation website. So it's it's been great. So Colette uh, Koski, um, can Parkinson be a non-genetic disease? Guess what, Colette? The majority of time, Parkinson's is not associated with a single DNA genetic change. It's only 15 to 20 percent of the time. The most common gene changes are this LRRK2, and we see a, a gene called GBA. And then there's the other one that we talked about uh, in younger people called Parkin. You know, for people in their 20s and 30s, that's that's a fairly common one. But for 80 percent plus, it's probably not a single gene. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is it then? And so is it your genes? You know, whatever your genes are, plus the environment, does something in the environment turn this on? And is this why we're seeing explosive levels of Parkinson? People have speculated that. We talk about this in the book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, about, you know, we, we're seeing uh, industrialization and the boom of Parkinson degenerative, degenerative diseases after industrialization. We're seeing chemicals like Paraquat, TCA, the, the chemical, the dry cleaning chemical, very high odds if you're exposed to these things, a higher 
risk of later coming down with Parkinson disease. And so, you know, super, um, it's a, it's a super question, but you know, it's something that we're, we're interested in there. There is a, an old adage that keeps getting, you know, used in over and over again and people say it, but it's good. So I'll, I'll say it to you. The genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. Um, everybody's used this quote. Uh, it's actually a University of California researcher I've heard is the original person, but everybody has reused it. It's become cliche, but there is some role for both. And so, um, so I think that, uh, that that's important. Bruce Davis talks about having Parkinson for seven years. He's found many things that help uh, control it. He is taking the same meds as seven years ago, but he's learned about foods and uh, and other things. And, and, you know, one thing I would say to you, Bruce, um, I said this before, the longer that I practice medicine, the more humbling it is for me. And I, I say that, you know, like, like I do less each day. If you have Parkinson for a long time, and for several years and you're not changing at all and you're on the same meds and you're doing great, that may be one of the rare instances that you want to get a dopamine transporter scan or a DAT scan to make sure that you actually have Parkinson because some things look like Parkinson and don't. And so we've seen these scans without evidence of dopamine deficiency. The word sweat, I hate calling people sweats. People are not scans, okay? But in early clinical trials, we try to enroll people as soon as they get Parkinson's. So a lot of times they have a little bit of shaking or tremor. We're not sure if they have Parkinson's, they go in the clinical trial, 15%, 15 to 20%, one out of every five, one out of every six don't actually have Parkinson's. We learn that from uh, doing a dopamine transporter scan. And so if you keep going at this rate, you've either got a very mild form of Parkinson, the subtype, which is awesome, Bruce. And, and you know, that's the kind of Parkinson I want, but you may at some point, if you haven't done it, want to get a DAT scan just to make sure that you have Parkinson, because that may take that off the table and, and, uh, and change your life, you know, in a, in a good way. And so, uh, so I think that that's, um, something to think about. And I know Bruce is talking about fava beans. We talked about mucuna. Uh, as um, as alternative methods of treatment. And Sarah is asking about, uh, what about cannabis and microdosing of cannabis? And so, um, Sarah, great question. We have a whole section uh, about cannabis. I started writing about cannabis in one of my books called uh, Breakthrough Therapies and Parkinson. And people said, well, you know, this was back in 2015, five years ago. And I said, well, you know what, Sarah, there are cannabinoid receptors all over the brain. We can either ignore them or we can embrace that there are receptors all over the brain some are next to dopamine receptors and some are in really key regions and so we can use drugs to target them and so there's a whole bunch of different formulations different cannabis plants different um, balance between whether you have thc the chemical that causes uh, uh, the potential for hallucinations and the, the sort of psych psychotic or, or psychedelic effects. And then you can have CBD that has, doesn't have any of that stuff. Some affect driving, some don't affect driving. So we're learning. But one thing I can tell you that my, um, my people in my practice, my persons with Parkinson that I take care of have taught me is that many of them have taken CBD even without THC and improved in anxiety um, maybe one of the most powerful anti-anxiety meds I've, I've seen without that same sedative effect as benzodiazepines like clonazepam and lorazepam and Valium. And they've improved in their sleep and they've improved in their pain. So we don't know yet, you know, like which of the symptoms. We think it's going to be more effective for non-motor symptoms than motor symptoms. But the, this discussion may be much more complicated than we thought initially because there's so many different receptors, so many different places where it can work, so many different symptoms. Parkinson is the most complex disease in medicine, period. It has more motor, non-motor symptoms, responds to dopamine, DBS, changes over time, all these windows, motor fluctuations. Sarah, it's complicated. So it may be at different you know, time points in the life cycle of Parkinson that the cannabinoids are really outstanding treatments. And so keep your eye particularly of what patients are telling me for many years, anxiety, sleep, and pain. We'll see if other things, you know, may be affected, urinary symptoms, other non-motor symptoms. We haven't seen as much benefit in the motor symptoms. Maybe it's, you know, formulation, maybe it's not the right med, but there's something there. I mean, there's something there. I believed it since 2015, but we believe in data. 
we want to see the data and we have multiple groups all over the world that are looking at cannabinoids and and uh, in in the setting of parkinson and so hopefully we will have data for you so as we come to the close in the hour i just want to say thanks uh it's been super nice to be with you today this is our our book living with parkinson's disease it just came out right after our other book ending parkinson's it's now out of the out of the uh the warehouses from robert rose the cookbook publisher so it's out there with all of our pearls and tips and uh, we hope you um, enjoy it and uh, leave us a review on uh, Amazon.com. We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet me at, at, at Michael Oaken. I also have a blog with Hindu Silvermania and Parkinson'sSecrets.com where we interview a lot of the experts and, and keep up on a lot of the, the new uh, things that are happening. I want to shout out and say thanks to Parkinson's Foundation for allowing us to come on. We have so many questions from all over the world. I mean, we were in South Dakota, we were in the Netherlands, we were in Indonesia, we were in Guatemala and Central America, we were in the Midwest. And, and I'm just flipping down here and there's so many that we didn't get to. So we're gonna talk to our colleagues at Parkinson's Foundation. Maybe we'll do this again um, and have another, another round of living with Parkinson's and answer your questions. It's been a lot of fun. Our aware and care kits at the Parkinson's Foundation are, are free. Uh, all you need to do is call our group. We speak Spanish. We speak English on the line. We can answer your questions on both sides uh, of those languages. Hopefully, in the future, we'll get some more funding. Maybe we can even do other languages. And um, and so call. You can get an aware and care kit if you think you might be going to the hospital or you want to be prepared to go to the hospital. You can ask us uh, questions. This is the best staff of medical professionals uh, I've ever met on the Parkinson's helpline. And then Kathy Whitlock, Leilani Pearl, um, Ronnie Todero, John Lear, uh, Jim Beck, just a great clinical education research team at the Parkinson's Foundation. They're here to help. They have all sorts of books on all sorts of topics that are up to date and free and up on their website. Great blogs. We've got a coronavirus blog that's been going since the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of these times that we're all uh, fighting to get through. And so Thank you again. It's an honor to be with you. We are uh, right here at the hour mark, and we'll put this up online so you'll be able to enjoy it and replay it. So if you missed it or you want to share it, uh, feel free to share it. And uh, and we'll we apologize for not getting to everybody's questions. And so maybe we'll we'll ask uh, uh, Kathy Whitlock and Lilani Pearl if we want to do this again. So I hate to leave questions hanging, but but thank you all. Have an awesome day. Stay safe. Bye bye.